Today I want to give a message to you that I believe the Lord has placed in my heart. It's about the road to Emmaus. I'm going to read Luke chapter 24, and it's several verses. I want to read that, so I want you to listen as I read through these scriptures. I'm going to start in verse 13 and read all the way down to 32, and then we'll pray, and then let's just hear what God has to say to us today. Luke 24, 13. Now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us, when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we will rejoice and be glad in today because you made it. You made it for us, and you made it for your glory. So we're going to rejoice in it. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would breathe through me today as I try to bring this message forth. I pray, God, that you would bless the ears that hear this message. I pray, God, that you would open up our minds to, to hear maybe what we haven't heard before and to, to truly trust in you like never before. God, I'm praying that you're going to use this season that we're walking through to to reset us, to renew us, to refresh us, God. I just know you're up to something greater than we could ever imagine. And so I give you praise and glory and honor for all that you do and all that you say, even before we hear it. And we give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my car has an autopilot. Actually, it's, it's, it's not my car. It's like, it's me. I don't know if any of you do this or not, but sometimes I get in my car and I'm going to head to the grocery store or to Lowe's or something like that. And before I know it, like subconsciously, I pull, in the, I pull into the parking lot of the church or, or I pull into the parking lot at Keller Williams where I work. It's like I was on autopilot and where I was headed, I thought, it's not where I ended up. I don't know if you do that or not, but that's something that I do. Also, this, is, this other thing about driving and roads is April and I, we have this thing. I'm not going to call it an argument. I'm, I'm going to call it a thing where I'm driving somewhere and I take a turn and, and she will say something like, you know, you could have turned that way. Or, or if I go straight and she's like, why didn't you turn there? Or, or if I turn left, she's like, 
you know, you could have turned right. And I don't know if anybody else does that or not. But, but I would love to say that I'm always right. But I'm, but I'm not. You know, sometimes she does know a better way. And I also need to admit that sometimes I, I turn the opposite way just to aggravate her. And by the way, now would be a good time to pray for your pastor. I probably just had something thrown at me while I'm sitting on the couch. But pray for me. But in all seriousness, we're talking about roads today. And, and roads are a great uh, metaphor for life, really. I mean, sometimes roads get really curvy. And sometimes they get really steep. Sometimes they get rough. Sometimes they're really fun. And sometimes they're, they're long and they're boring. And it's a really good metaphor for life. And today I want to talk about a road. It's called the road to Emmaus. And I want to talk about what it taught these two disciples walking down this road. What it taught them about the Lord and what it can teach us about the Lord. Because we're all on a road. In many ways we're on the same road. Those that know Jesus, we're on the same road, but, but we're also on different roads. Uh, we've got different things going on in our lives, and, and many of us are having the same struggles at this time, but, but, but we're also probably having different struggles. And so I want to relate to you maybe about the road that you're on and how it relates to the road to Emmaus and, and maybe what God has to say for you and to you about it. And I just want to start off by saying the road isn't always easy. And I don't think I have to say that. I think that's something that you already know, that the road isn't always easy. Well, these two disciples of Jesus, they were walking down a road, and, and really it was a road of disappointment. I mean, they were disappointed. Their Lord had been crucified, taken from them, gone. Their hopes, their dreams, their future, it was gone. And we've all traveled this road before, this road called disappointment, when things didn't turn out the way we wanted to, or things became heavy, things became uh, hard to bear. I mean, the enemy uses disappointments. He uses these, this, these things, this road called disappointment, to discourage us and to deter us. He wants to use these roads to separate us from God. He wants to use these these roads of disappointment to uh, weaken our faith, to attack our faith, to cause us to question God's care for us, to cause us to question God's power and God's sovereignty. Man, the enemy uses these things. But as the song says, the one that our praise team just led us in, he never promised that the cross wouldn't get heavy. And he never promised us that the hill wouldn't be hard to climb. He never promised us that the road would always be smooth. Sometimes it's rough and sometimes it's disappointing. But the good news is that Jesus is with you. And as disappointed as you may be on the road that you're on right now, you're not alone. You're a son or daughter of the Lord. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is with you. He is Emmanuel. He's right there with you. And I believe that it, it shows something really cool about Jesus, this message. That Jesus here, he intentionally finds these two followers that are walking seven miles home from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, these aren't one of the twelve disciples. The Bible just calls them the others. <laughs> aren't you thankful that God cares about the others one of them, his name is Cleopas, but, but he just says, the Bible just speaks of them saying, they're the others. And I'm glad that, the, that God doesn't just care about important people. Because I don't know about you, sometimes I feel like I'm not one of the important people. Sometimes I feel like I'm just one of the others. Well, this is a message for you today, that God cares about the others. He cares about all of us. Time after time, the Bible shows us how many times that He cares. Different situations, different circumstances where God cares about you. He cares about, the, the Creator cares about the people that He created. Well, as they walk down this road, the two of them, on this seven-mile journey home, look what happens in verse 15 and 16. It was while they conversed and reasoned 
that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now I got stuck on those words as I'm reading this. That their eyes were restrained. And whenever I'm trying to get a message together for the church, for the body, and I'm seeking the Lord, there always seems to be a, a few words in the text that really just come alive to me. And this, this is the words today. That they were restrained. Their eyes were restrained so that they did not know Him. And so I'm asking myself, how is that possible? And really, there's only two possibilities. Number one, they were so disappointed, so out of it, so dejected, that they didn't recognize Jesus. I mean, they just were convinced that He was dead, convinced that He was gone, their faith was weak, and so they just did not even remotely think that this guy walking with them could be Him. Number two, Jesus restrained their eyes. Jesus kept them from recognizing Him. Now, I believe that's why. I believe that it was Jesus that restrained their eyes so that they couldn't recognize Him. I believe Jesus did it. And I know what you're asking, why? Why wouldn't Jesus just walk up to them and say, Hey, here I am, I'm back. And they would all just rejoice and dance on the road and have a good time. But Jesus had a purpose for restraining their eyes. He always has a purpose for what He does. And I believe His purpose for them, I, I really think it can hit home for us in the road that we're on right now. I believe He wanted to teach them something. I believe that He wanted to, he wanted to show them something. You see, Jesus wasn't planning on staying. In just a few days, Jesus was going to ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where He is today. That's where He is. And so Jesus wasn't planning on staying. And so he was going to restrain their eyes so that he could begin to teach them and prepare them. You see, he's the good shepherd. He's always teaching, always preparing, leading us in the right way. And that's what he was doing. And so they needed to know. They needed to know how to carry on. How to carry on without being able to shake his hand or hug his neck. They needed to know how to trust Him without seeing Him. And that's really important. Because up until this moment, Jesus was always there to calm the storm, heal the sick, deliver the bound. He was always there to feed the hungry. I mean, they could just turn their head and make eye contact with God and say, we need your help. And He would help. But things were changing. And so they needed to be able to trust Him without seeing Him. Usually they could look and see Him and they felt safe, but today they didn't feel safe. Today they felt vulnerable. Today they felt defeated. Today they felt disappointed. And they needed to know how to make it without seeing Him. So Jesus restrained their eyes in order to teach them. Now if you're walking down a road in your life right now, and you are, I'm sure, but maybe you're walking down one of those roads where it feels like God is absent. It might be that God's teaching you how to trust Him without seeing Him. You look at your trouble, you look at your disappointments, you look at how rough the road, and it's very visible, but then you look and God, God's not visible. It's like God's invisible, and all your problems are clearly visible. What do you do? What do you do? We've all walked through times in our life where our trouble was more visible than our God. Let's be honest. We've all done that. Where the enemy seems right here in front of our face. And it would appear that God is absent. Well, there's a scripture. And I believe this is going to help us. There's a scripture that I've, I've often used in funeral sermons. And I've used it probably in most funeral sermons. You at least... We'll mention it in praying with the family or preaching the message. and It's a very common scripture, and, and you've heard it before. And it's, It says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And it's a scripture to show us that we should be confident that when someone is absent from the body, that they are present with the Lord. 
And it's a scripture found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's verse 8. But there's a couple of verses ahead of it that shows us how to be confident in this life when we are present in the body. I want to read it to you. 2 Corinthians 5. And instead of reading verse 8, let's just look at verse 6 and 7. He says, So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And so that doesn't sound as good. It sounds good to say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It doesn't sound as good to say to be present with the body is to be absent from the Lord. And that's why you don't hear that verse much. But verse 7 says, this is how and why we can be confident even though we are present in the body and absent with the Lord. Verse 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, our eyes are restrained. We walk by faith, not by sight. So as confident as we can be to know that if we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord, we can also be confident when we are present in the body and absent from the Lord because we walk by faith and not by the things that we see. We are still in flesh and bone bodies. And the Lord is with us but he's not here with us like he was with the disciples. We can't look over and make eye contact with him. He's not physically sleeping in the boat during our storm. It's different. And we've got to admit that it was different for these two disciples. And it's different for, for us. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And I know we have the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about him in a moment. But, but what I want you to know is that. We've got to know how to walk through this life being present in the body and absent from the Lord because there will come a time when we are face to face with the Lord. But that time is not now. Now is a time that we walk by faith and not by what we see. And that's how we can walk in confidence in this life. We often get so disappointed because we don't see the things we want to see. Because things don't happen the way we want. And we get so disappointed and we forget that God didn't create us to walk by sight. He created us to walk by faith. And so many believers get out of balance because they begin to walk by sight. And look here at what God is doing. And look at this at what God did. And so we begin to live off everything that we see. And when we don't see what we thought we should have saw, now God has abandoned us. God has forgotten us. Why don't we just give up? We forgot our foundation was not what we see. Our foundation was what we believe, who we believe in. Our foundation is faith. Faith. This is what Jesus is teaching them. This is it. Everything that he did is he led his disciples, training them, equipping them. He was preparing them to be able to walk by faith and not by sight. But after the resurrection, it's like Jesus doubled down on teaching this. You remember doubting Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas. He said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and the scar in his side, I won't believe. Well, Jesus showed up. He did. But do you remember what Jesus said when he showed up for doubting Thomas? In John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who's he talking about? Who are the blessed are those? Who are the those? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm one of those. Look at them. Say, you're one of those. We are one of those who have believed even though we have not seen. I wasn't there when Jesus died. As the song says, I wasn't there to see him rise. But I believe. I believe in him. I believe in what he did. I believe in what he does. I believe in his finished work. I believe that he's called me. I believe that he's placed me on the road that I'm on right now. And if that road gets rough, he has not abandoned me even though I can't see him. He is with me. It's called faith. It's called faith. It's called faith. Faith is believing without sight. And the church needs to mature when it comes to this. We only think of faith as a tool to receive a miracle, a tool to move a mountain, a tool to get money. I mean, come on. 
Faith is about staying the course when the miracle doesn't happen. Faith is about remaining confident in the Lord when the mountain doesn't seem to move. Faith is about sticking with it when things don't look right, when things don't, don't look like they're going according to plan. Faith is sticking in it, standing up, and being on a foundation that is greater than what you see with these two eyes. Many of the followers of Jesus that he was equipping, leading, training, many of the followers of Jesus would be tortured, fed to the lions, skinned alive, set on fire like torches. They would die horrible deaths because of who they believed in. They needed a faith that wasn't moved by the lack of seed. They needed a faith not to move a mountain, not to work a miracle, not to pay off a debt. They needed a faith that would stand even when their world was ending. He was teaching them how to see differently. Every road has a purpose. We got to remember this. Every road has a purpose. You've got to learn to see things differently if you're going to understand this. To truly realize that there's a purpose with every road and to see the purpose and live out the purpose You've got to learn to see things differently. You've got to learn to see with your ears. That's right. You've got to see with your ears. Your ears are important. That's why God gave you two of them, right? Also, you might lean one side or the other if you didn't. But that's another story. You can see with your ears. I want to show you. You can. You can. Romans ten seventeen says, Faith comes by seeing. No. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, don't you watch this. Jesus restrained their eyes so that they wouldn't recognize Him. But then what did He do? He took them to the Word. And He went back to the Old Testament. He showed them Moses. showed them Isaiah. He showed them Daniel. He showed them Ezekiel. He showed them the prophets. And everything that the prophets and the law... And the word said about him. While they couldn't see with their eyes, he let them see with their ears who he was and why he had to die and why he had to suffer in order to enter into his glory. He was teaching them how to see with their ears. So that's part of God's plan. If you can have the faith that comes by hearing then the things you see won't have the same sway on your life that they do now. If you live and breathe by what you see and experience, no wonder you have fear and doubt and anxiety. No wonder. But if you can learn to live and breathe based on what you've heard concerning Him, based on what you've heard concerning His promises, based on what you've heard concerning who He is and who you are, what well, changes everything. That changes everything. God help us to see more with our ears. So I believe that Jesus also restrained their eyes, not only so they could see with their ears, but also so, they, so that they could see with their heart. So you can see with your heart too. You're learning some things today. Seeing with your heart can always happen, even when your ears don't work. Some of what I'm showing you today is if your eyes don't see, and even if your ears don't hear, you can see with your heart. Did you know that? Did you know your heart has eyes? It does. Ephesians 1.18 I pray that the eyes of your heart may be open, may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. It's a heart thing. It goes deeper than your eyes and your ears. Luke 24.32 after Jesus revealed himself to them, look at what they said. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? When the Bible says the heart, it's not talking about this organ that's pumping blood through our body. It's talking about our spirit. I mean, our innermost being. I mean, who we really are when this flesh and bone is gone. It's us. 
and our heart right there. I mean, we feel it right here when we get emotional. We feel it right here in the center of our being. It's, it's us. It's who we, who we are. And there's a song that we sing that says, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And why does it say open my eyes so I can see you? Because there is a sight that's deeper than our eyes and our ears. It's our heart. It's our heart. Our heart can see in a greater capacity than our physical eyes. That's why. That's why even after our loved ones have passed and gone, we still have them right here. We still have the memories. We still have the good times. Nobody can take that away. I mean, we've got it. It's here. It's here. It's deeper. It's deeper than what we see. Jesus restrained their eyes so that they could learn to see with their ears and their hearts so that they could trust Him through the Word and through the Spirit. Now, this road. This road to Emmaus, this rocky road that you're on, I just feel led to tell you today that this road has a U-turn in it. It has a U-turn. You see, to them, it seemed like the end of the road. They were headed home. This is the end of the story. It was great while it lasted. You know, it was great to have known Him. It was great to have heard Him teach. It was great to have seen the mighty things that He did. But this is the end. Hey, this is the, Emmaus is the end of the road. And this is it. As they reached their little town, they asked their new friend, you know, come on in and eat with us. Because they, 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 maybe they, they felt inspired because as he spoke, their heart burned with passion. And so, eat with us. Come on in. And as they sat at the table, their eyes were still restrained. But their ears were engaged and their hearts were engaged. And Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And I believe when he broke it, and his hands opened up like this. They saw the scars. Or perhaps it was just in the way that he broke it. Or perhaps it was because their ears and their heart was now engaged in seeing. And they recognized this is him. This day wouldn't end like it started. This road has a U-turn. What seemed like the end of the road was only... The beginning of the road. You see, when these two followers, when they left Jerusalem and they passed the road sign that said Emmaus, seven miles, never in their wildest dreams did they imagine that they would walk seven miles home but then run seven miles back. But that's exactly what they did. They made a U-turn and they discovered that Jesus was alive just as He said they now had a deeper understanding because Jesus taught them how to see with their ears and see with their heart. And they understood that all that the Bible said about Him was true and they could count on it, they could depend on it, even what, when what they saw didn't seem to line up. And so they had a deeper faith and a deeper trust. And so they were thrilled to take this U-turn and go back to Jerusalem and share it with the other disciples. It was a spiritual U-turn. And if you think about it, the resurrection was, it was, it was all about spiritual U-turns. I mean, Jesus, He descended into hell. He took the keys of death and hell and the grave. And He set the captives free and He made a U-turn. And He came back up. It's a U-turn. The women, they, they ran to the tomb. Take it back, they didn't run. They went to the tomb to mourn. But then they discovered that the tomb was empty, and so they ran back. They did a U-turn and went back. We've already mentioned Doubting Thomas and the U-turn that happened in his life and in all the disciples' life. And now these two disciples went home but made a U-turn and turned around and went back. And there they waited on the promise of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said would come. God is all about U-turns. And I can't help but think that there's people listening today that God's about to turn you around, that, that there's a U-turn just about to happen in your life. And that this road that seems like it's going nowhere, God's about to make it go somewhere. 
and there's about to be a turn in the road that you didn't expect. And God's about to teach you how to look at something not with your eyes, but with the ears of faith, and with the heart of faith. God's going to do it. God can turn any situation around. Tony Campolo tells about the time that he was asked to speak at a Pentecostal college. For the service, eight men had him kneel so that they could place their hands on his head and pray. Tony was glad to have the prayer. But each of them prayed a long time, and the longer they prayed, the, the more they pushed on Tony's head. And then they even seemed to wander in their prayers. One of the men didn't even pray for Tony. He prayed for some guy that he was concerned about. He began to pray and say, Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stoltzfus? He lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side. And Tony wanted to interrupt him and say, God already knew where the guy lived, and God doesn't need directions, but he, but he, kept, he just kept kneeling there, trying to keep his head upright as they were pushing down. The prayer went on, Lord, Charlie told me this morning that he was going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something. God, bring that family back together. With that, the prayer time ended and Tony went on to preach at the college chapel. Things went well and he got in his car and he began to drive home. As he drove on to the Pennsylvania Turnpike, he saw a hitchhiker and he felt compelled to pick him up. Campolo said, we drove a few minutes and I said, hi, my name is Tony Campolo, what's yours? And he said, my name is Charlie Stoltzfus. I couldn't believe it. I got off the turnpike at the next exit and I headed back. He got a bit, a bit uneasy with that and after a few minutes he said, hey mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He narrowed his eyes and asked, why? I said, because you just left your wife and three kids, right? That blew him away. He said, yeah, yeah, that's right. With shock written all over his, over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off me. Then I really did him in as I drove right to his silver trailer. When I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, how did you know that I lived here? I said, God told me. I believe God did tell me. When he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, You're back! You're back! He whispered in her ear, and the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. And I said, With real authority, Tony said, The two of you sit down. I'm going to talk to you, and you're going to listen. And man, did they listen. That afternoon, I led those two young people to Jesus Christ. See how God can make a U-turn in your road. He had Tony going down a road that he thought he was going to take and he turned him around. This, this man that left his family was walking down a road that he thought he was headed down and God turned him around. And he interwove them both together to do something miraculous in them. That's the God that we serve. And I've been saying all along that God is going to use this season to pull off something supernatural in us. I mean, He's going to do something phenomenal. God is going to get glory from this season and this road we're on. You just watch. You just wait. You're going to see. Angel sung a song today that said, He won't leave you there. What's really amazing about the message is that Jesus sought these two guys out on the road to Emmaus. They were disappointed. They were dejected. And Jesus sought them out. He wasn't going to leave them in their disappointment. He wasn't going to leave them in that place of dejection. Because He is the good shepherd. And so He walked along beside them. And he taught them a new way to see. And I believe that's what he's doing for someone today. I'm going to pray right now. And I'm going to pray that that's what God does for you. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, God, that you care so much about us. That 
even when we don't think we're important enough that someone would care. You care. You care enough to come along beside us on the road we're traveling. To teach us and equip us and to, and to grow us. And I pray, God, that we as a church would learn how to see with our ears and our heart. That we would learn to trust in the Word of God. That we would grow our faith, Lord, by hearing Your Word. By speaking Your Word out in our lives. And by trusting in You. God, that we would never forget that every time we invite Your presence, every time we, we gather together, even when it's just our family, even when it's just two or three, there You are with us in Your Spirit, Lord, and in our spirit. And we can see you. Maybe not with our physical eyes, but we can see you in even a deeper and more important way than that. Pray, God, today, Lord, that you encourage someone. And I pray that today is the day that their road begins to turn. That today is the day, God, that their story begins to change. That today is the day, God, that they begin to see that there is a purpose for their life and there's a purpose for the road that they're walking down right now. And that there's also a great cloud of witnesses cheering them on and encouraging them from the heavens. And that there is a God that said, I will never leave you or abandon you. And I will send you a comforter. Thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for your presence, for your glory for your grace teach me how to see with my eyes closed teach me how to see what I need to see what you want me to see and help me to have faith when the road I'm on isn't easy I pray this in Jesus name Amen I want to say thank you today for joining us I want to say thank you today for worshiping along with us and hearing what God has to say. You, you know our announcements. They're pretty simple right now. And I cannot wait to give you new announcements of when we're going to meet together again. And I am ready as soon as, as soon as they say, let's do it, we're going to do it. And I can't wait for that day. And I just have a feeling we might not behave too well that day. But hey, that's all right. I'm ready to worship the Lord. I'm ready to be together with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. But I'm also ready to learn what God wants me to learn through this process. Thank you for joining us every Sunday at 1030. We're having prayer groups on Wednesday nights at 7. There's a Zoom link that you can join us on. And I'm just being blessed by the devotion that we usually do at the beginning. And by prayer, I mean, God, we're praying together. And it's a great group of people. And so I encourage you to join us on Wednesdays at 7 and pray along with us. Until then, we'll see you. Have a blessed day in the Lord. God bless you. The road you're on is God's taking you somewhere, somewhere amazing. Amen.